This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Now, joining us again in the post-game segment is Nick Galarnik. Now, let's get to that chart deck. Listeners, you're going to find the download link for the post-game chart deck in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, it means you have not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click on the red button over Justin's picture saying, looking for the downloads. Now, Eric, let's get to crude oil, starting with the EIA inventory. EIA printed a surprise build in crude oil inventory this week, building 1.3 million barrels nationally, with Cushing, Oklahoma drawing down 506,000 barrels. The really big builds, though, were on the finished products, with gasoline building 8 million barrels and distillates building another 6.5 million barrels. U.S. production held unchanged at 13.2 million barrels. The data have changed, and so has my outlook. My new base case for 2024 is for oil prices to stay about where they are, plus or minus $10 up or down from where they are right now, through most of the year. Demand is clearly weakening, and supply tightness that so many analysts expected has not materialized. I think a lot of the reason for that is that there's more black market supply in the system than official data reflect. Because the Biden administration is so strongly motivated to keep gasoline prices low through the election, I now see the risk of a major Middle East war escalation as an outlier rather than a base case scenario. But that said, I still think the outlier risk is much greater than most market participants perceive. America's enemies understand full well that election year politics create an incentive for Biden to avoid any military escalation that threatens energy prices, and it's already clear that they're going to exploit that weakness as an invitation to test the limits of Biden's restraint. The Houthi attacks on Red Sea shipping are evidence of this. As I see it, Biden faces something of an all-or-nothing conundrum. He can't afford to allow energy prices to just gradually creep higher in a way that the American people might blame him or his policies for. But if the American people perceive President Biden to be responding to a serious threat to the country, and particularly if the situation is presented to them so that they believe that foreign terrorists are to blame for escalating energy prices, and they perceive President Biden to be taking a tough stance to defeat the terrorists responsible for those higher energy prices, then those higher energy prices won't be nearly as damaging to Biden's re-election prospects. So I perceive this as a situation where Biden is likely to continue to mostly stand down and avoid escalation unless and until he sees a clear opportunity to shift the perception of blame for higher energy prices to foreign bad guys. In that scenario, I could easily imagine a very rapid and dramatic escalation of the conflict in a way that does threaten oil supply. Again, that's an outlier risk, not the base case. But my point is, I don't don't see any reason to expect any slow and gradual build-up to an escalation. The Biden administration will continue to avoid escalation until they decide to go all in. And if they do, which is not certain, it could happen very quickly. But absent such an escalation, I think oil prices are likely to hold present levels and possibly drift lower if economic demand weakens into 2024, which seems entirely possible. Well, Eric, for me, uh, technically, what we are seeing here is that we, after a, a three-month bearish decline in oil, we're finally seeing uh, the environment where you know oil gets slammed three dollars on a down day, and the next day recovers. Uh, the type of price action that means that, uh, if at least for now, the selling has subsided, that doesn't in itself make it a new bull trend, but uh, that that is a characteristic that uh, is often found near bottoming formations and. 
And uh, if you go back and look on the chart in that May-June period where for two months oil stopped making lower lows and consolidated sideways, the question now is, are we seeing a similar style bottoming formation developing? What's really easy about this is that with that 50-day moving average uh, just hovering above, just like the breakout that happened in July above there, that's a really easy arbiter of trend that you could just look for the breakout to see whether oil is uh, starting a new trend. But it wouldn't surprise me if we still spent uh, a week or two just consolidating in here before something more meaningful happens. But let's see whether or not a bottom develops here. Now, moving on to equities, I want to get Nick involved in the conversation. Now, Nick, let's start with that S&P 500. Obviously, we have a OPEX coming up next week. Uh, what are you, levels are you watching? Yeah, Patrick. So spot price right now on SPX is approximately 4790 We have a call wall just above at 4800 and a put wall below at 4700 also acting as support. The implied move for next Friday's January 19th OPEX is plus minus 60 points, giving us an implied upside of 4850 and an implied downside of 4730 Now, I'm inclined to think that we see a touch of the all-time high at 4818 approximately, possibly a touch as high as 4850 but no further than that. Following the January OPEX, I see a window of weakness to the downside, in which case we potentially touch as low as 4650 area on SPX. What are your thoughts? Well, it's interesting. Okay. On page four, I have that chart of the S&P 500 futures. We're testing that previous high. Obviously, CPI was not the big market mover. What was going to be really interesting to me is uh, we have a big earnings coming out. A pig in the python moment for earnings is uh, in the coming week. And then we end with the uh, uh, FOMC rates meeting at the end of the month. And so right now, the prevailing trend is higher, uh, higher highs, higher lows. Everything is being well accumulated. The breath hasn't did started to massively deteriorate in any way. And so you have to respect the prevailing trends and uh, and expect that at least on the interim, we may actually make a little bit of a higher high push on this. But what will, will be interesting is once we get to the, all these major news events coming up towards the end of the month, will we see February be a trend shift? And will we see the pattern emerge that way? To me, uh, I think we can make it probably into next week week's OPEX with the current trend staying in place. And then we'll certainly see uh, how things shape up going into the end of the month. Now, Nick, when we're looking on page five on the queues, uh, what levels are you watching on that NASDAQ? Right now, spot price on the queues is approximately 410. We have a call wall right at this level at 410. We have a put wall below at 400. And the implied move for next Friday's January 19th OPEX is plus minus six points. Therefore, the implied upside is 416, and the implied downside is 404. Right now, key resistance is currently at 410, where we are right now, all-time highs, and key support is at 400. Uh, as I said, weeks past, I'm more bearish on tech than I am on the broad market. I still do favor small caps. Um, right now, we've seen NVIDIA take off by about 7% in the past week. Uh, Meta is almost at all-time highs, and Google is pushing higher as well. Apple has shown weakness, as is Tesla. Um, I'm most bullish right now on Google, actually, for the prime reason that they're actually forcing ads now on YouTube, and you're seeing a lot of ads there. So that's one thing. And then additionally, I think that they've uh, they've laid off a lot of workers as well, so they should see their margins expand a little bit in the coming quarters. So Google probably bullish there. Uh, Meta probably bullish as well as we're approaching all-time highs at 384 area, only about $13 off there. Uh, NVIDIA, I think, has ran too far too fast, but again, that's uh, my most stock at this point, so I won't touch that one at all. But I'm still favoring the small caps if we do get that push to all-time highs on SPX. I think that you know the Russell can push up to around 210 and IWM, and that's where I'm placing my bets right now. Those are interesting observations about the uh, NASDAQ. But for me, uh, the fact that the MAG7 continue to show leadership is what actually is keeping the prevailing trends going. Obviously, that we can speculate as to when there is going to be a big turn point. And uh, obviously, if we were to have a much bigger market correction at some point, the MAG7s would certainly have to have topped out and be participating on downside just simply because of the huge market cap weighting of them. Uh, 
at this moment, uh, what's interesting is is that generally the S and P is uh, a bit stronger than the Nasdaq, but the Nasdaq Mag Sevens continue to be leadership. And I'm looking for when will we see a divergence in that? And that just hasn't materialized for me. Anyway, let's uh, uh, jump to the volatility index. Uh, and what I'm continue to be surprised at is how low volatility is going into what I think is some pretty big news at the end of the month. What's your take on the VIX here? So right now the VIX is at approximately 13 or so, which denotes that we should see about 0.8% moves top to bottom intraday on SPX. After next Friday's OPEX, I expect the volatility to pick up because um, the pinning effect of next week's OPEX is very, very great given that it's one of the largest OPEXs based on open interest over the last couple of years. So I expect an expansion of volatility post next Friday, which is why I think that we'll see a decline in markets into the February OPEX perhaps. Now, moving on to page seven, we have the US dollar index. What are your thoughts here, guys? Well, we've broken through channel resistance now, but it was a horizontal breakthrough as opposed to an upside breakout. The market has been waiting for CPI data as a signal on where Fed policy might go next, so it's not clear yet where the trend is headed. And of course, CPI came in this morning pretty much as expected. So let's see how the market digests today's as expected CPI print and whether or not a new trend is established by next week. Well, my view on the dollar index is that the prevailing downtrend is intact. Lower highs, lower lows, the resistance at the 102 and a half to 103 initially stalling the dollar price action. If the dollar remained weak and went for a double bottom retest of either the July low or just the December low here, uh, would be continued to be a tailwind for risk assets. And uh, that therefore may be the short term path of least resistance. With that said, I don't think that there's a big downside risk to the dollar here. While the dollar is uh, certainly in a downtrend, this is probably very close to where we're going to start seeing bottoming formations. And inevitably, when the dollar reacts in some bullish way on the upside, I think it will be on an inner market basis, a big signal. I don't think it's imminent. I don't uh, get put a high weighting that it's going to happen this week between this week and next week. But at some point, it will give a big signal. On the short term, if it was back down to 101, re- creating a double bottom uh, is certainly something that uh, would not shock me. Eric, you wanted to take a deeper dive into gold this week. What's on your mind? Let's take this on in two parts. First, the short to intermediate term outlook, but then since this is our first show of the new year, I'd also like to comment on the longer term big picture of where I see this headed toward the end of the year. In the near term, the pattern of higher highs and higher lows may be starting to falter in the sense that the swing high that we put in on December 27th was equal to the prior swing high from December 1st. So we didn't get a lower high, but we didn't get a higher high either. A lower low, meaning a daily close below 1990, would be cause for real concern, at least in the short to intermediate term. But after CPI came in pretty much as expected, I think the market is already trying to put in a swing low here. The slow stochastics have already started to flatten out, and we've already tested channel support with this week's intraday plunge down to 1222. So long as we can stay above 1,200, the pattern of higher lows will remain intact. Patrick, I'd be curious to get your take on the pattern of higher swing highs giving way to an equal high on December 27th, just above the key resistance level of 2085, which we've been watching for months now. Eric, on page eight, I have that gold chart and put that 50 day moving average on there. And you can see that generally this entire pullback on gold has simply a mean reverted back to a moving average that has found support in the past. If we see generally the risk on impulse working, the dollar, let's say, and it deviates back down to its lows, there's nothing stopping uh, gold from going back and retesting highs again and generally trade ranging up along these highs. But generally, I still think on the very short term, uh, there's volatility risk. Ultimately, uh, if we at some point see the stock market to have a, a hiccup and start to uh, pull back and, and risk assets are sold, then obviously gold heading back to 1900 would not be a huge shocker uh, on the short term. But in the bigger picture, I think that there's lots of opportunity. 
Moving on to the bigger picture now, I'm convinced that 2024 will be the year that will break out to new all-time highs, and probably a lot higher than that. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see the market above 2500 a year from now. The reason is that while we don't yet know the timing, it's nearly a certain bet that by the end of the year, the Fed will begin cutting interest rates. Even if we see a modest return of inflation, pressure to reduce the federal government's borrowing costs is mounting as deficits run out of control and the national debt continues to grow to mind-boggling levels. And for those of us who've been convinced that the Fed is a lot more political than it likes to admit, the very notion of abandoning an already announced plan to cut interest rates in an election year seems completely implausible. Now, the market loves to embarrass as many people as it possibly can, and long gold has already become a very crowded trade in anticipation of this upside breakout to new all-time highs. So I don't rule out the possibility of a sharp correction, perhaps as low as 1900 or slightly below that level, especially if the Fed is slower to begin cutting than many people have predicted. But before this year is out, I expect higher prices and probably much higher prices. Patrick, I know a lot of our listeners are thinking, as I am, about how to leverage the upside potential with options, especially if we get a buy-on-dip opportunity below the current market. Patrick, you're Mr. Webinar, and I, for one, would love to hear your thoughts on how to play the breakout to new all-time highs that I'm expecting to see sometime this year, and in much more detail than we have time for here on the podcast. Now, I'm guessing that you've probably already got something along those lines planned for your big picture trading subscribers. So I'm going to do my job here to advocate for our listeners. And uh, Patrick, can I persuade you to throw in a freebie webinar as a holiday gift for our Macro Voices listeners? Eric, my position is completely aligned with your view. While the next few months have plenty of room for volatility in both directions, we are in a perfect macro backdrop for an extraordinary new bull breakout in gold later this year. The key for most listeners is that agree with this view is how to position yourself to maximize your returns. I'm going to be doing a special webinar on Monday, January 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, going into depth on the macro thesis and strategies on how you can magnify your gains in the coming new gold bull market. You can find the link in the research roundup email or visit bigpicturetrading.com to register for the free webinar. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. 
For more information, visit macrovoices.com.